Last time, we learned how to find the values of the parameters for a first order or second order system from the step response. One of the reasons we would want to do that is so that we can have a model of the system that we can then use to tune controller gains from a simulation or analytically rather than doing the trial and error approach that we used on our rack and pinion earlier. In this video, we're going to learn one method of finding the value of the gain KP in proportional control from a system model that we've obtained using the method that we learned previously. Previously, we looked at a block diagram for feedback control that looks something like this. I'm going to start here today and be a little bit more specific about how this block diagram works. The first thing I'm going to do is take all of this stuff on the top and lump it together into one block. I'm going to label this one block plant. Plant is a bit of controls terminology that we use to refer to our whole system that we're trying to control. So in our particular application, the plant includes the motor, the rack and pinion, the power supply, the motor driver chip, and even all of the wires and other parts that are a part of the system that moves the rack and pinion together. The input to this plant is the PWM compare value, and the output is the position of the rack. Now, the PWM compare value comes from this other block, which I'm going to label KP. In our PSOC control code, we have an equation that takes in the error in the position, multiplies that error by KP, and that product becomes the compare value. We then read the position from our encoder, which I'll just label here as sensor. And that position feeds back here, and I'll draw a little circle, and then give an input. This is our target position. So I'm going to put a little plus here and a little minus here, because our error is equal to the difference between the target position and the actual position that we read with the sensor. Now, I want to note for a moment that this KP block is our control block. We could have written other kinds of equations here instead of KP. For example, we could have done a full PID equation. I'd like to relate what's going on in this block diagram back to the equations that we learned in the last video, and also the experiments that we did with the step test. So I'm going to label this output position x of t, and I'm going to label the target position u of t. Now we've already done an experiment, the step test, to find out what is the relationship between u of t and x of t. And we found that relationship to be this. We did a test in which we set kp to be some value, and we used the data that we collected to calculate zeta, omega n, and g, the three variables that are circled in this equation. Now, if you've taken a class either in controls or in ordinary differential equations before, you know that I could take the Laplace transform of this equation in order to convert this equation from a differential equation into an algebraic equation. I'm going to do that here now. When we take a Laplace transform, a derivative becomes converted into the variable s. So the second derivative of my x of t here becomes s squared, since I have two derivatives, times x as a function of s instead of being a function of t. My next expression becomes 2 zeta omega n s x of s, 
than omega n squared x of s. If you haven't had an ODE class before or you don't remember the Laplace transform, don't worry about it too much for now. I'm showing you the derivation of why this method that I'm teaching you today works and you'll be able to use it even if you don't remember Laplace transforms. So if this Laplace transform is mysterious to you, don't worry about it too much yet. Just keep trying to follow along. Now I could simplify this equation by finding something that we refer to as the transfer function. The transfer function is the output divided by the input. X of s here is my output. So I'm going to put that in the numerator. And I want to get u of s in the denominator, because that's the input. And then I'll write on the right-hand side everything that we're left with. Now, let's look back at our block diagram to see why this is useful. Back here in the block diagram, I'm going to give a variable to the plant. I'm just going to call that h of s. It has some function, and we don't know what that function is, and that's okay for now. The sensor also has a function, but that function is just the number 1, because the sensor takes the position as input and produces the position as output. So it's the same thing as saying that the sensor takes in the position, multiplies it by 1, and produces that same thing as the output we can write the entire block diagram equation as x over u by using this equation. This equation comes from a set of rules of something called block diagram reduction that you'll know if you've taken a controls class before. And if you don't know, that's okay. This equation is the only block diagram reduction rule that we'll need in order to do our controller tuning. So we've already done an experiment where we've found the relationship between x of s and u of s in this particular system that we have set up. We set kp equal to 1 and we measured the output of a step response. So we could write this equation like this. When kp is equal to 1, we have h of s over 1 plus h of s is equal to the second order equation that we found previously. Now, you've already calculated values for the gain, the natural frequency, and the damping ratio when kp is equal to 1 for your specific system. I'm going to now go and get the numbers that I calculated for g, omega n, and zeta for my system and put them in to give you an example of what we're going to do here. When I did the kp equals 1 test to my own system, I found the gain was equal to 1, zeta was equal to 0 0.6, and omega n was equal to 14.5. I'm going to plug these numbers into this equation. Next, I want to solve for h of s. First, I'll multiply both sides by 1 plus h of s and I'll also multiply both sides by s squared plus 17.4 s plus 210.25. Next, I'll gather the h of s terms together on one side of the equation. Finally, I'll divide both sides by this term in order to get h of s by itself. Okay, now that I have an equation for h of s, let's look back up at the block diagram again h of s is my plant, that is all of the stuff that I'm trying to control, not including the controller that I'm using. So now that I know an expression for h of s, I can suppose that kp is now actually a variable. Remember that we have this equation here. This time, instead of plugging in values for kp, g, omega n, and zeta, I'm going to leave kp a variable. Here, I've plugged in the equation for h of s that we just found previously. I'm going to simplify this down a bit by multiplying the numerator and the denominator both by s squared plus 17.4s. 
Now, do you recognize this equation? This equation looks just like this other equation that we found a moment ago. I'm going to go back to it now. A moment ago, when we started from a second order system, took the Laplace transform, and then found the transfer function, we got this standard form of an equation. Note that the numerator is g, the gain, times omega n squared. Omega n squared shows up here. And then this value here is 2 zeta omega n, and the value here is 1. Our equation follows the exact same form. This is also a second order system, as we already know from having tested the closed loop system. Here, we know that 210.25 kp is equal to omega n squared because this expression shows up here in the same location as omega n squared. We can also say that 17.4 is equal to 2 zeta omega n. So how could we use this to find a control gain value for kp? Well, let's suppose that we want to have a critically damped system. Critical damping, we know, occurs when zeta is equal to 1. So let's let zeta equal 1, and then I'm going to plug that back into this equation. And then I'll solve for omega n. Once I have a value for omega n, I'll plug it back into this equation up here, and I'll solve for kp. I find that critical damping is accomplished at kp equals 0.36. When I tried to find the kp value for critical damping experimentally, I found a lower value, kp around 0.2 or so. So the number that I found analytically is close to the value that I found experimentally, but it's not exactly correct. So why do we have some discrepancies? Why are these values not exactly correct? There are a couple of reasons that are important to note that will help you correctly design control gains in the future. When we use analytical methods to find control gains, we are relying upon a couple of assumptions that are sometimes not good assumptions. The first assumption we are relying upon is that the system is linear. Linearity in a system, that is the plant, the thing we're trying to control, means that if I double the input, the output will also double. Or if I have the input, the output will also have. Well, in our system, we already know that this is not completely true. If I double the compare value to the motor, does the speed always double? Or if I have the compare value, does the speed of the motor always have? It does not. Back when we did our very first tests with the motor, we found that the internal friction of the motor was large enough that the compare value had to be something like 30% or 40% before the motor would start to move at all. Friction around the motor's zero point is a non-linearity in the system, and it will make your analytically determined control gains inaccurate when you're using linear methods to find those control gains. There's one more assumption that we're making that's very important to keep in mind. This assumption is that our control loop is infinitely fast. In our control loop, we did a test in which we had a delay of one millisecond in the loop. And later on, we did a test where we changed that delay to 10 milliseconds. And we saw that the behavior of the system was very different with a 10 millisecond delay than it was with a one millisecond delay. When we calculate control gains using analytical methods like the one I just showed you, we are assuming that the control loop is an analog control loop. In other words, it operates 
infinitely fast. There is no delay at all in the loop. Now, even if we would take out all of the delays that we have put into our control loop, it would still not be true that the control loop was infinitely fast because there are some lines of code that have to be calculated and executed in each control loop. Now, note the effects that this, these two assumptions had on our calculated versus experimental KP value. The KP value that we calculated is higher than the KP value we determined experimentally. These two assumptions often have the effect of making uh, the control behavior seem better than it actually is. Our calculated value suggests that we should be able to take KP all the way up to 0.36 before we have overshoot. But experimentally, we found we could only take KP up to about 0.2 or even less than that before we had overshoot. In practice, it's generally not a good idea to calculate a KP gain and then just use that calculated KP gain and assume that the behavior of the system will match the behavior that you expect. Instead, you should take your calculated KP value reduce it, and then check the behavior of your system, and then do fine-tuning experimentally. So these methods of finding control gains analytically are good methods for getting close to a good KP value, or KD, or KI, as the case may be. But you will still need to do some fine-tuning by hand in order to account for irregularities in the system that aren't accounted for in your methods. For the lab submission for today, take the step response that you found for kp equal to 1 and calculate, using the method that we learned today, the kp value that should give you a critically damped response. Then put that KP value back into your system and look at the step response that you get. Compare the step response that you get with the calculated KP value to your actual step response. Make some observations on how the actual behavior of the system with your calculated KP value differs from the response that you would expect from the zeta and omega n values that you calculate analytically.